and how additive manufacturing is set to leapfrog the barriers in medicine in this ASEAN conference on additive manufacturing. I am Dr. Rafael Bundok, and my team is one of the first to venture into the application of 3D printing in medicine in our country. I work in a very busy tertiary training center, the teaching hospital of the University of the Philippines, where we are usually faced with extreme medical challenges, making 3D printing a very potent tool to solve many of our problems. The adaptation of 3D printing in the field of medicine across the world has been pretty lethargic. At best, constituting only 11% across all fields here in this 2017 survey. It has remained almost the same until this great plague that has changed our lives. And I would like to draw your attention to this very simple but very concrete example. As patients were filling our intensive care units in the earlier months of March to July of 2020, when my hospital was transformed into a COVID center, our intensive care doctors faced a blank wall with a very simple problem. There was no supply of this inline MIDI adapter, a contraption that was often taken for granted because it was almost never used during ordinary times in the intensive care units. This small inline media adapter is used to deliver a strong jet or stream of aerosol into the system of tubings from the respirator to the patient. And in the case of a COVID patient, to deliver an even meter dose of steroid aerosol to control the inflammation of the lungs to enhance oxygen exchange in a patient fighting for his life. This little attachment is expensive, but the cost is not the issue as doctors were willing to shell out their own money just to get hold of one to save their patients who are dying in front of them. The problem was that none was available and to import one of these would take days or weeks at a time when patients were dying by the minutes and hours. We need many of these pieces badly and fast. That was the time when one of my colleagues grabbed a caliper and started measuring one of the only three items we have at the ICU at that time, and got his iPad and started configuring one using a CAD CAM application. Within hours, we were printing this little item, a real lifesaver. Within a couple of hours, we were able to 3D print dozens of these MIDI adapters. And we started delivering perfect mists and streams of aerosol to the patients, gasping for breath. Of dear life. And now no one could ever imagine how 3D printing saved the lives of so many Filipinos who were dying in the early days of COVID pandemic in the Philippines. With this said, I could already end my lecture regarding the use of 3D printing in medicine, but how much else does 3D printing apply to medicine? And how much does more does it save lives? The human body is a sophisticated machine. It is a very complex ultimate machinery. It is such an expensive and sophisticated merchandise that if not properly taken care of, like this beautiful state-of-the-art vehicle, it can be damaged extensively. Repairing it though is an easier task because most of the part of this vehicle can be replaced from off the shelves. Basically, the human body can be damaged by five entities. We have inborn defects or congenital anomalies. It can be traumatized. It can be infected. And hopefully, in our lifetime, we don't have a tumor like this. And of course, the inevitable. Aging, which slowly wears and tears our anatomy, which all of us have to contend with sooner or later. But not to worry, because doctors and bioengineers have created so much to, to diagnose and treat our problems from a simple thermometer, to deliver medications with syringes and needles, 
to provide treatment with simple band aid and to mend our damaged body with sophisticated implants and devices to save our lives and improve our quality of life. All of these have one common denominator. All of these items were mostly created by subtractive manufacturing. Subtractive manufacturing has already provided us state-of-the-art medical technology. But there's still a lot of barriers that are unresolved by subtractive manufacturing. The following are the general barriers in medicine. Accurate or precise biologic modeling. Patient-specific instrumentation or surgical templating using guides. Tailored administration of drugs and medicine. And finally, the holy grail, creating the perfect tissue organ replacement. Let us first tackle the first two as they are related in many ways. Accurate biologic modeling and patient-specific surgical templating. In 2019, the systemic review of 3D printing literature application in medicine showed the surgical guide templating and accurate 3D biologic modeling constitutes the most utility of 3D printing in medicine. Now, let us regress back a little bit to memory lane. It all started in 2000, when 3D printing was utilized to come up with anatomic modeling based on medical DICOM images. Doctors were excited. It has been a long dream for most of us to study the deceased anatomy of our patients at the tip of our fingers, to fully hold it and play with it, to fully understand its pathology very well and plan the procedures in a very specific regions of the body that we have to treat. This is very valuable for specialties like orthopedics, ENT, and even plastic surgery. Difficult cases in neurosurgery became a lot easier to conceptualize to enable surgical firsts using 3D printing. Thoracovascular surgery, even obstetrics gynecology, and urology were no exemptions in benefiting from this technology of 3D printing. Imagine oncologic surgery, where you can completely demarcate your tumor excision or section even before you open up the patients, making sure that you have a perfect guide to remove everything completely during your surgery and leave no tumors behind. In fact, 3D printed anatomic models specific to the patient that you are treating is becoming a common fixture nowadays in the operating theaters and operating rooms, something we have never imagined when we were medical students. However, these 3D printed models before were very expensive because they used to be based and monopolized by elite industries. For almost a decade, they were beyond the reach of common medical and surgical centers, and the downtime was very long from the time of submission of your DICOM files, processing, and the delivery of the biologic models that are already 3D printed. By 2013, the landscape significantly changed when desktop personal 3D printers entered the commercial market which now allowed us to do our own 3D printing exactly in the comforts of our home and offices. Right in the comforts of our home, clinics, department offices, and even call rooms, 3D printing paved the way for your DIY or your do-it-yourself anatomic modeling, practically bringing it to our own doorsteps, circumventing the industries who once held the monopoly in this venture. It is simply a matter of converting our patient's DICOM images into SCL files that allowed us to come up with perfect 3D printed materials that give us normal and pathologic models which are case-specific to the patients we are handling and treating. 3D anatomic models have been very valuable in patient education and doctor training and preparation. It is very important in pre-surgical evaluation and the haptic preparation of the surgeons and for surgical templating. These do-it-yourself anatomic models 
are very precise one-to-one -one specimen of our patient's pathology, like the cervical spine model, which we are preparing for surgery the day before. These anatomic models can be cut, drilled, sold, and machined the way we will do it during surgery, allowing us to practice before the actual surgery days before we enter the patients. It helps us to do precise measurements, pre-cut, and contour our implants, and even try our surgical contracts, thus saving us vital minutes intraoperatively that has leads to more refined and faster surgeries. Nowadays, educating our students, residents, and trainees have never been so much fun with these 3D printed anatomic models. Something I wish we had when we were medical students and under training. Let us briefly take patient-specific surgical templating. Accurate biologic modeling provides us precise surgical templates or guides to allow us to perform very precise cuts, drilling, and sewing during surgery. When we cut body parts, we have to be precise to safely remove exactly what we need to remove from the pathology of the patient. And a millimeter of error can be very disastrous. 3D printing has provided a solution with exact precision. The use of 3D printed surgical cutting and drilling guides is slowly becoming a potent tool for modern day surgery, something that we can only dream about before when we were young doctors. 3D printing has provided us the means to create and fabricate complex guides based on accurate 3D printed models or biology to perform cutting edge surgeries. We performed the first 3D printed assisted surgery in the country seven years ago on a very complex spine surgery in a small child. Here is a surgical template we created at that time based on the patient's biologic model that we did 3D printed in our department office. These templates should allow us to drill precisely on the very narrow bone corridors in our patient to provide injury to the spinal cord and the surrounding blood vessels of the spine. This is a short video clip just to give you a vivid understanding of how these surgical drilling guides are being utilized intraoperatively when we perform our surgeries. By applying this template over the spine, it has allowed us to do very precise drilling over the very delicate spine of a very small young patient close to the base of the skull to prevent injury to the spinal cord. This allowed us to insert our screws to stabilize the spine of the patient very, very safely. On another front, 3D printing also enabled us to perform rapid prototyping for designs that we want to come up with. 3D printing has facilitated construction of forking models direct from sketches on a piece of paper. Here is a 3D printed working model of a wrist external fixator device, which we designed and a working model was printed thereafter the following day. Unlike before, where it will take weeks or even months before you can even get hold of a working prototype from a machine shop. It only took us two days to create a prototype of our external fixator model. And here you see how it would be applied to patients with fracture of the wrists. These are plumb designs for an improvised external fixator device used to fix broken bones, which was 3D printed during the Typhoon Yolanda International named Haiyan that devastated our country and which we actually used on two patients during our relief medical operations in the aftermath of that typhoon. This is how it is assembled to hold the fractured side of the patient and stabilize a patient's broken leg before we do further surgery once the patient is brought to the hospital. Way back in 2013, 
when I first purchased my desktop 3D printer, the very first time I had an experience of its utility for medical purpose is replacing this part of our very expensive spine endoscope, which was lost. That was when I realized that 3D printing would be a very useful solution to replace the lost part of our tubular endoscope. Well, we never found this connector again, but we have printed several dozens of these replacements, which we use up to now when we use this spine endoscope on our patients. Then, we also use 3D printing to create varying diameters for our tubular retractors for our minimally invasive spine surgeries, whereby metallic fabrication of these tubes by subtractive manufacturing proved to be very expensive and time-consuming. Whereas with 3D printing, we can print as many as we want at a very less expenditure. We were also able to design it in such a way that we were able to incorporate and isolate the very delicate scope to protect it from damages when we are using it during surgery. Unlike this model, the original one, where the main scope is exposed when we are performing our surgery. 3D printing allowed us to expand the utility of our endoscopes for surgery because of additive manufacturing. Prosthetics and orthotics are one of the main beneficiaries of 3D printing. It has been a game changer for prototyping devices for patients with disabilities and amputations. And it has managed to democratize its utility to third world and developing countries as the price and the raw materials for 3D printing keeps on becoming very competitive and affordable to many. It has also empowered patients with disabilities by catering to their emotional and psychological setbacks by providing them with avant-garde designs for artificial limbs. Simply, aesthetics of their own design and their own creations. Let us go to the last two barriers and let us take tailored drug delivery first. Believe it or not, these six women have one common denominator aside from being all females. They all weigh 154 pounds. Our weight vary according to the mixture and proportion of our fat, muscles, bone composition, and our retained water content. That is why the biggest challenge for physicians and doctors is to tailor fit the medications we give to our patients. It is not as simple as giving medications according to the body weight in a complex disease that afflict man. To be more concrete, this is a better example. As we get older, the pill boxes that we utilize becomes bigger and bigger as our body succumbs to more diseases. Taking these medications become more complex, necessitating taking many different drugs at different specific time of the day. 3D printing has that exact technology and capability of providing our patients a personalized drug therapy where everything can be placed in one pill whereby digestion and egress can be controlled. And the release of its active ingredient can be programmed as well. And this can be done with very specific time releases in a thousand combinations. This technology is not futuristic as they have clinical trials regarding this already. It's just a matter of time when 3D printed drugs will be standard way of delivering drug therapy to our patients. And lastly, is creating the perfect tissue or organ replacement. Creating artificial limbs and functional body parts is the holy grail of medicine. Can we really print specialized body organs like a heart? Is it even possible? There has been numerous successes with simpler tissues and we are definitely going into that direction. But most of these tissues that have been successful so far are thin layer or homogeneous tissues, not the complex type of tissues like the liver, the heart, 
pancreas, and the kidneys that have complex vascular, neural, and endocrine components. They have created three to four layers of skin good enough for simple biologic coverages. Well, of course, until our own body produces our skin underneath it. They have 3D printed simulated bones structures with the basic calcium and phosphorus content, but without the bone cells that make it a living structure. They have 3D printed cartilages that can be used as this replacement, but it is short of being attached to a living bone because it simply won't attach. It was relatively easy because the cartilage is a vascular, meaning it has no blood vessels, and it is a neural, meaning it has no nerves. It is relatively a primitive and a simple tissue. Currently, organ printing is very experimental. An ideal organ is more complex than what they have so far 3D printed because it has to be heterogeneous with multicellular components with an intricate microcirculation to supply oxygen and nutrition to make it alive and for it to respond to electrical and hormonal stimulations and one that needs reparation or reparative capabilities as it wears and tears by the day. Circulation for blood supply and oxygenation is important and the vessels they have 3D printed so far have no capability for autoregulation like what nature provided us with our normal blood vessels. Our normal blood vessels are dynamic. They are pulsatile, opening and closing depending on thermal, pressure, and hormonal changes or stimulation. A 3D printed blood vessel as of now is simply static and simply acts as a tube. Our organs are stimulated by electrical current coming from our brain, mediated by a very complex neurotransmitter system. Now, how to connect and interface these 3D printed organs to our brain is an ultimate challenge. Yes, they have incorporated artificial circuitry to a 3D printed organ, but it goes way beyond this. At best, what we have as of the moment is merely a proof of concept that it is possible and it will take many more years to come to come up with a perfect 3D printed organ. But as research and development push through, I am confident that we will get there. This, my friends, is a 3D model of the COVID virus as seen from the electron microscope. This 3D model helps scientists and researchers understand how these spikes touch our body and initiate the cytokine storm that has killed millions of people already. This specific 3D printed model help scientists develop new vaccines and technologies that are now saving lives as well as our own. This 3D model helps us to see our invisible enemy up close for us to be able to initiate all the treatment modalities that we need to combat this pandemic that has changed our lives. And if still you are not convinced that 3D printing is poised to leave frag virus in medicine, I believe, my friend, I should rest my case. Thank you very much for your attention. Please stay safe. We have to survive this pandemic and continue 3D painting for a better future and a better life. Goodbye. Wow. Thank you, Dr. Bundok, for that very uh, incredible presentation and uh, very touching. So you see how we have witnessed how the additive manufacturing or the 3D printing has revolutionized. We'll support you. Thank you. So may we check on our technical team if there are questions? Yes. Are you okay, Dr. Bundok? Yes, yes, I can okay. hear you. Okay, we can hear you clear.
So the question is, what CAD software does doc, uh, do you use for designing parts or segmenting DICOM files? And what model of 3D printer does you, uh, do you use? And what are the most used materials for this application? This is from Mr. Roland Remeni. Hello, uh, we use quite a lot of uh, free applications. The most common that we use is the Horus because uh, many of us doctors use uh, Mac, no? and Horus works very well with Mac. As with the 3D printer that we use, we use the regular available commercially 3D printers, like for example, mine is Up3D and Ultimaker. Uh, we use a fusion position method. No? Uh, we're now experimenting on, uh, on SLE uh, printers because uh, we have done studies that show that our anatomic modeling is better printed with the uh, SLEs, no? stereolithography printers. So uh, there's a, quite a number of printers around. Anything can be uh, used. No? And the aim is uh, for us to be able to do very good segmentation so that your DICOM image when transferred to STL will really produce very good anatomic models. Thank you, Dr. Bondok. Another question? Hello. So the, the next question is from Mr. Barnard Peralta. Uh, were there challenges in sterilization of the 3D printed tools? As of the moment, we don't have any 3D them inside the operating room. So uh, these models that we use in the operating room, we also have to sterilize them. We sterilize them using gas sterilization. And uh, we experimented on uh, testing the models that we use and even the templates that we use. We found out that uh, there's no shrinkage with regards to using gas sterilization. Of course, we, not, we cannot use autoclave because autoclave will totally melt all this plastic. So uh, it's easy to sterilize them using gas sterilization and they can be brought inside operating rooms. One last question. Uh, how can 3D printing compete with injection molding for large-scale production? This is from Mr. Ryan Corpus. Well, of course, prototyping, uh, in the realm of prototyping, 3D printing has a very, very large advantage over uh, uh, plastic injection and subtractive manufacturing. So once our prototype seems to be working well already and all refinement has been done, the final production can still be done with 3D printing, but now that will take time. With injection molding production, you can really mass produce it. And I think that's the way to go. Combining additive and subtractive manufacturing plus injection molding facilities to be able to come up with good things with regards to the use of 3D printing in the medical field. Question, Dr. Wanda. Uh, from uh, Ms. Dulce Blanca Punzalan, what are the updates in 3D printing of synthetic bones, example, particles 3D, and rattan-based bone implants? Yes, that's a very nice question because I'm an orthopedic surgeon and that is very close to my field. No? So far, they have already done a lot of uh, 3D printed bones, no? but you have to understand that a bone is a living structure. It has both organic and inorganic components. With regards to the inorganic component, 3D printing has already solved that. They have already produced bone models with very good cortices and cancerous part. Need to say, they have simulated the intricate interstices of a real bone. Now the challenge is how to apply bone cells into these 3D printed bones to make them living structures. Because you have to understand a bone is not a static structure. It's not an ordinary thing that is just there in our body. It has bone cells inside it that will produce the bone metabolism needed because a bone upbuilds and a bone resorbs. A bone will put on more calcium and phosphorus to build up. And when the time needs, when the time arises that the body needs calcium and phosphorus, it releases it. So the question is, Will a 3D printed bone act the same way as a natural bone? And the only way by which it can act that way is for you to incorporate bone cells inside the bone. 
And that will be the real challenge of 3D printing, how to incorporate living bones or living bone cells inside the bones. By the way, you know, the bone cells inside our bone constitutes only about 10% of the whole bone structure. But that little 10% controls the metabolism of the bone, the way it acts. If a bone fractures, it heals because of the bone cells. Now, will a 3D printed bone, when it fractures, will it heal? It will not heal because it doesn't have any bone cells. So again, we have to find a way to incorporate bone cells into our 3D printed bones. Again, Dr. Bondok, your presentation has raised so much interest and we have a lot of questions received, but uh, in the interest of time, we have to limit only to four questions. So anyway, this is not the last I mean, uh, opportunity to have, with, to have Dr. Bondok. So we will have Dr. Bondok very frequently <laughs> in the next, uh, maybe next, tomorrow, next year or many years to come. Appreciation is awarded to Dr. Rafael Bundok for imparting valuable knowledge as a resource speaker during the ASEAN Conference on Additive Manufacturing 2021. Theme 3D Printing, Revolutionizing the Manufacturing Industry, October 28 to 29, 2021. Given this 28th day of October 2021 at Dusitani Hotel, Makati City, Philippines. Signed, Engineer Maranito T. Margarito, Conference Chair, ACAM 2021. Dr. Annabel V. Briones, Director of Industrial Technology Development Institute, DOST. Again, Dr. Rafael Bundok, please accept our Certificate of Appreciation. Thank you very much.